The title of my message this morning is Life in His Name. Life in His Name. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Are there any skeptics among us? In a crowd of people like this, there has to be a few who question or may even have open doubts about the gospel. I know that I've not been immune to questions and doubts about my faith. Several years ago, I was like many of you. I was a 18-year-old attending the University of Florida. Uh, campus was a large new world for me. And there are several things that I needed to figure out, not the least of which was how I was going to exercise my faith while on campus. My freshman year, I really, really struggled. I was by no means the model Christian. I was at that time teaching Sunday school in the church that I grew up in, because the church that I grew up in was just outside of Gainesville. So this Gainesville area was, was home. I was connected to youth ministry back at the church that I grew up in. I was involved in the BCM. I attended crew meetings with some close friends. And I was even connected to the college ministry at the church that I grew up in. But I had my foot in both worlds, in a sense. I was one way on campus my freshman year and quite different when I wasn't on campus. I struggled to live out my faith when I wasn't around my church friends. I'm sure there were days where it would be hard to distinguish me from a non-believing UF student. I had doubts. Was my faith real? Was it worth it to follow Jesus? Was following Jesus worth giving up all the things that I had to give up? I couldn't do what my peers did on campus. Being a Christian meant that there were things that I should and things that I should not do. And I was struggling to be faithful to God. And I'll never forget at the end of my freshman year feeling so much regret and so much guilt. I was really disappointed in myself because of how inconsistently I followed Jesus. You see, I doubted God's goodness. I questioned if following him was better than being like the world. I doubted his plan and his purpose for my life. In his grace, he led me to trust him. By his mercy, I was able to hold fast to the faith. And that was not without stumbling, not without falling at various times, but the one who sustained me was greater than my fears and much greater than my doubts. You see, this morning, we're going to see a man who also had doubts. His doubts were a little bit different from mine, but he had doubts nonetheless. How do you rid yourself of doubts? How can you grow in your faith? Does the Bible even address these types of questions? Well, we're going to see all that and more as we dive into this passage this morning. We've been going through the Gospel of John for some time now, and I'm delighted this morning to continue to lead us through this amazing book. We're almost done with this Gospel, um, so turn again with me to John 20. We're going to start in verse 19. Typically, what I would do with you guys is read the verse and then like break it down and explain it. I'm not going to reread any of the verses, so you're just going to have to stay tethered to your Bible this morning. Um, and just keep looking down to make sure what I'm saying is actually in God's Word. Uh, so we're going to start in verse 19. My first point is faith revealed. Faith revealed. We're going to see peace revealed. You see, there's so much backdrop in this text before us. I'm not going to re-preach the messages prior to this morning's, but you must remember the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ as having taken place just before what we're going to hear from God this morning. Jesus Christ was dead and lifeless on Friday. The light of the world went out, and that sky was darkened on that darkest of days. But then Sunday morning arrived. And the disciples and the women who visited Christ's tomb discovered that he was not decaying, but rather he had been revived and reanimated. And what a glorious day that Sunday was. Mary Magdalene quickly went to tell the disciples that he had spoken with her and that he had met her outside the tomb. Surely 
they most likely doubted whether she saw and heard what she thought she saw and heard. Having been closely connected with Jesus, the disciples gathered together, as they always did, minus Thomas in this instance, and undoubtedly they took time to comfort one another over the loss of their teacher and Messiah. It was then, on that Sunday evening, that Easter Sunday evening, that resurrection Sunday night, that the most unexpected event would take place before the gathered ten disciples minus Thomas. Notice first that they were gathered together. This has always been the practice of God's people to gather. The family of faith has from that Easter evening until now prioritized gathering together on that first day of the week, which isn't Monday, by the way. That first day of the week, they worship God corporately. They love being together, worshiping together, serving one another, and encouraging one another in love. We follow and do likewise in their faithful footsteps that they began back then. But even though they were together, they were afraid. They were afraid of the Jews. They were afraid that those who had killed their master could just as readily kill them. And so they locked the door and made sure that no one could get in who wasn't supposed to be there. They barred this door out of terror. The last thing they were expecting was a resurrection. On their bingo card, there was no box checked for crucified Messiah. What they were expecting was a conquering king. For three years, they'd followed the miracle worker. How do you take out someone who could raise the dead? How do you take out the guy who can calm storms and heal people and feed 5,000? How do you take out someone like that? You see, they listened to everything that he said, but they didn't really get that whole dying part. They didn't come across to them. And it is into this fear that Jesus comes. You see, he meets us when we're afraid. He doesn't wait for us to come to him. No, he graciously comes to us in the midst of our fears and our doubts. He doesn't wait until we have enough faith to overcome our fear. Rather, he gives us the faith to overcome our fear. He tells us in Isaiah, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And even though the door was locked, he appeared in their presence. That word in the text for the door means that it was literally barred, and yet he came right in anyway. He actually fulfilled his promise in John 14, 18, where he says that he will not leave them as orphans. He was with them. The first word he spoke to them was the word peace. In the middle of their terror, he came to them and told them that peace was with them. And there's an extent to which this is a basic greeting in their culture, but I believe that he repeats this phrase twice for many reasons, one of which is to emphasize that this is more than just a greeting. He is imparting to them the peace of God. He is offering shalom in his presence. And to be at peace is to be whole, to be complete. It's having a sense of being where you were made to be. And I believe that this text is a primer on how to relieve doubt. And few things can destroy doubt like the peace of God can. You want to be free of doubt? Seek God's peace. And what secures that peace? His broken body on the cross. Those nail-scarred hands and that pierced side purchase the peace that we need to be reunited to the Father and to Him. Because He was raised, you can have peace. And see here that He wasn't a spirit. This wasn't ghost mode Jesus. This was no apparition. This was the living, breathing, touchable Jesus, the Messiah. He was back completely, as he was before and yet in a glorified body. The disciples didn't dream this up. He had a real, literal body, 
In Luke 24, verses 36 through 43, we see a parallel account to what we see here in John. And in that passage, he actually eats this broiled piece of fish with his disciples. He was as real as they were. They rejoiced. Once they put it all together, that he had really returned to them, that he wasn't dead and gone for good, but that he was alive, they rejoiced. It's understated by John just how happy they were to have Jesus back. But Luke tells us in his account that they were thrilled. And can you imagine their conversation? How excitedly they spoke to one another, the joy that they had, recognizing that he had returned to them again. And we see the presence of Jesus and secures, it guarantees for us two things his presence does. It gives us joy as they had, and it gives us peace as they have. Both of those are inseparable in his presence. He was sent. Jesus was sent from the Father, and in turn, he is sending us. We are a sent people. We've been sent with the word to share, and we have the good news to give to the world that there is hope beyond the grave. There is life in his name. And in this passage, we see the John version of the Great Commission that we find in Matthew. We have a sending God. We are a sent people. But if you're going to be sent, you have to have power. And so he talks to us about the Holy Spirit. We have this message, but the Holy Spirit is our power source. He is the one who gives us the ability to proclaim the good news and to do this in boldness without any fear whatsoever. Our Savior breathes on the gathered disciples and gives them the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of power is our power source. God's Spirit enables us to fulfill the mission of God. And this is a special dispensation of the Spirit before Pentecost. Obviously, Pentecost was the full fulfillment of having the Spirit, but this was just a little foretaste, a temporary empowering before the full and permanent outpouring of the Spirit. How did these guys go from being cowering, fearful, afraid um, individuals, these disciples? How did they go from that to being these bold, powerful witnesses? It was the Spirit. It was the Spirit of God who gave them this boldness. You don't proclaim the gospel in your own power or by your own strength, but by and through His. And then he says, I'm worried about forgiving sins. You see, it takes significant courage and power and faith to overcome some of the obstacles and challenges that seek to assault our faith. During World War II, German Christians had weighty challenges that they had to overcome. Those Christians, many of them were Lutheran. They lived in the state under Nazi rule, and initially they tried to follow their unbelieving peers by submitting to the direction that the Nazi German country began to go towards. Eventually, a group known as the Confessing Church organized themselves, and they pushed against the so-called German Christians who are actually devout Nazis closely tied to the state. The confessing church went against the heretical views of the German Christians, but they did not go as far as to openly resist Nazism. Rather, they congratulated the Nazis on their political moves. They simply wanted to be known as a body who defended the Orthodox Christian faith against religious innovations. But within a few years, hundreds of these confessional church pastors were arrested. They were arrested because their witness to Christ's lordship over the entire world was an embarrassment to the Nazis and a direct challenge to their supreme leader's totalitarianism. They tried to hold in tension dual allegiance to Christ and an anti-Christ ideology. But our Savior suffers no rivals to his throne. Only the Holy Spirit's power and the forgiveness of sins offered in the sacrifice of Christ could truly bring about the peace that the believing Germans were seeking. There are many areas in the Bible where the language is poetic. Poetic speech is employed here by our Savior to explain to us the powerful reality that the gospel that we proclaim can grant forgiveness 
or even confirm the loss of forgiveness. You see, for centuries, verse 23 of chapter 20 has been misinterpreted. The Catholic Church interpreted this verse to mean that popes and cardinals, bishops and priests could alone forgive sins. Only they could absolve the guilty. Only they could pronounce God's forgiveness on God's behalf to humanity. But no, this verse is not limited to the clergy alone being able to grant or deny forgiveness. The Lord does not make this forgiveness granting the exclusive responsibility of the disciples. We know this to be true for several reasons, not the least of which is that there are no examples of the disciples granting forgiveness in the book of Acts. If this was a power that they alone had, then surely it would be on display right from the beginning. If they exclusively had the privilege to do this, then certainly they would have described it in their letters that we have contained here in the Bible. No, none of that is true. So what does this mean? What our Savior is communicating here in our passage this morning is that believers, all believers, based on the finished work of Christ and a person's true repentance can authoritatively announce forgiveness or in the case of the unrepentant, judgment. We have the message of life. And we know that when we proclaim the gospel and a person believes it, that person, that person is forgiven of every sin that they've committed. Should we tell anyone that they can have forgiveness with God with a full and clear conscience? Absolutely yes. We can say this based on the authority of God's word. And consequently, when a person rejects the message of salvation through Jesus Christ alone, we can authoritatively say that that person does not have forgiveness. And in that sense, we can fulfill the words of our Savior here in verse 23. And what a, what a privilege and a responsibility as God's messengers. What a sacred and solemn duty that we have that we can give out the words of life. And what a wonderful way to ease doubt when you trust in the promises of God that when you believe savingly into his Son, you are fully forgiven of every sin and every act of rebellion that you've ever committed in your entire life. I pray that this reality is true for everyone who is listening right now. That that forgiveness is not just theory, but it's practical. It's something that you've experienced and received to yourself. Let's look at verses 24 through 29. We see faith explained as well. We see faith explained. We see Thomas, who was the apostle for doubters. We talked about being a skeptic this morning. Thomas is the apostle for doubters. Finally, onto the scene between verses 24 and 29, Thomas arrives. This was the man who was earlier probably off sorrowful somewhere, utterly depressed when he was absent from the other disciples. He's finally entered the picture. Typically, people call this apostle doubting Thomas. We saw even in the passage that we read earlier that Thomas had strong questions when it came to believing that Jesus had really risen. He questioned whether everyone really saw what they thought they saw. He even makes the bold claim that unless he personally, directly touched the scars of Jesus to know that it was really him, he would never believe. His skepticism was strong. And I believe that Thomas is relatable to many of us who are gathered here this morning. He knew that Jesus died. That much he could confirm. That much he had seen. But that he had risen? No. That was truly unbelievable to him. And I agree with so many others that the best way to view Thomas is not as a, a doubter per se, but rather as a pessimist. Thomas is actually one of the least silent disciples in all of the Gospels. He speaks multiple times, all of which are recorded in John. He speaks in John chapter 11, verse 16. He speaks in John chapter 14, verse 5, before he speaks in this passage before us here in chapter 20. And every time that Thomas speaks, he's speaking with a negative bent. 
He always sees the glass half empty. He's blunt and direct and straight to the point. He just views the world through a negative lens. He can always see what could go wrong, and he has no problem speaking his mind to let everyone else know as well. He's been disappointed in life so many times that he is cynical. His doubt and his questions are born out of his pessimism. And doubt for all of us can come from many different places. But I think it would be helpful for us to mention just a few sources of doubt. Number one, there's moral doubt. Moral doubt comes about when a person seeks to change one's theology to justify their actions. Most often to justify their sin. You doubt your belief to make you feel better about your choices. You doubt the reality of the scriptures to ease your conscience so that you can feel better about doing what God has prohibited. Slowly, over the process of time, through the course of many choices and decisions, one drifts away from the truth and begins to doubt. For example, a person stops reading the Bible, stops praying, attending church, and then gives themselves over to sinning with their bodies. Eventually, they say, I never really believed all that Bible stuff anyway. J. Buskowski, a professor at UT Austin and a Christian author, he said these words. It's a funny thing about us human beings. Not many of us doubt God's existence and then start sinning. Most of us sin and then start to doubt his existence. There's moral doubt. There's also gullible doubt. You see, a person gets confronted by a critic who raises tough questions that they can't answer. And then that person begins to doubt. For example, a professor questions the person on some aspect of Christianity that they may not be very comfortable with, and they begin to not know how to respond, and that leads to doubt. This person was socially connected to the church, but never truly committed to the Savior. Their discipleship was weak, and it faltered under pressure. There's gullible doubt. But it's also sorrowful doubt. See, there are some people who have been hurt so many times in life that they begin to doubt the faith. This was Thomas. He had been disappointed many times, and he turned to questioning and eventually to mistrust. His hopes were in the tomb. He knew that Jesus died, and how could he then be the Messiah? Shouldn't the Messiah win? Thomas has been hurt. He's wounded. He put all his hope in Jesus. He thinks surely the other ten are wrong. He has sorrowful doubt. Eight days after Thomas makes his bold and negative assertion that he will not believe unless he feels the scars of Jesus, the disciples are all back together again. And this time, Thomas is present. The door, once again, is locked. And once again, Jesus proves that locked doors are no barrier to him. And what personal care on our Lord's behalf in this moment, that when he appears before them again, he goes right to Thomas. And he gives him direct evidence of his resurrection. What tenderness to go right to Thomas and address his first words to him. Perhaps no other disciple was so tenderly treated than Thomas. Jesus fulfills the words of Jude 22, which says, Have mercy on those who doubt. Let that encourage you today. You of little and weak faith, he is tender to all of his sheep. The other disciples had already had an opportunity to see him and to verify that it really was him. But now Thomas has an opportunity to believe as well. It's helpful to note what Dr. Tony Marita has said. He said, anything that is worth believing is worth questioning. 
Jesus can handle your questions. He doesn't reject Thomas's desire to put his hands in his scars. Despite our Lord condescending to permit Thomas to put his hands in his scars, there is no evidence that Thomas actually did that. All Thomas actually had to do was to see the scars. Seeing was believing for Thomas. Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, not because you have touched my scars, you have believed. Upon a clear and accurate view of Christ, Thomas placed his entire belief and trust in the Lord. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He becomes worshiping Thomas. No longer is he doubting Thomas, but now he gives the clearest, most succinct declaration of the deity of Christ, maybe in all of Scripture, when he makes that proclamation. He immediately saw and knew that the man standing before him was his master. This is the same master that he had been following for three years. There was no longer any doubt in Thomas's mind. He immediately cries out in worship of the Savior. And Jesus did not disavow this. He did not rebuke Thomas for proclaiming that he was God. No, he graciously and rightly accepted this proclamation. Previously, Thomas had heard the other ten say that the Lord had risen. It was the other disciples whose faith was strong. He had their testimony of the resurrection, but that wasn't enough. He needed to see him for himself. And now that he had, his faith was strengthened and secured. Thomas's faith was now his own. It was personal. And that individual personal trust in Christ was enough to save his soul. So too is it with you. Your faith must be personal. It can't be your friend who brought you to church this morning. It can't be your grandmother's faith or your sister's faith or your aunt's faith. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. Just like Thomas's faith was direct and personal for him, so too does your faith have to be direct and personal for you. You can't get into God's kingdom through anyone else, through any other person. He has to be your Lord and your God. Now, there is no better witness than thoughtful, critical, examining Thomas. For him to have absolute certainty is the most solid of evidences that you can have here in God's word. Do you remember that great story of faith in Mark chapter 2? You have Jesus who's traveling and he's going around proclaiming the gospel and doing miracles and he's healing the sick and he eventually decides to come back to Capernaum. And when he comes back, he goes into this house and he's in this house teaching about God. And the house is so full that it's just completely packed. And there are these guys who have a friend who's paralyzed and they're trying to get into this house to see Jesus. They know that if Jesus will look at their friend and know his condition, he will be able to heal them, but they can't get in. They try to go to the front door, and it's so full of people, it's so packed that they can't get into this house. So these guys exercise a tremendous faith and love and care, maybe like few people did in this guy's life. They got, all four of them, they got up on the roof. And not only did they get up on the roof, but they were able to get their friend up on the roof with them. And right in the middle of Jesus preaching and teaching, these guys just begin to tear a hole into that corner of the roof. And they have their friend, this this paralytic, this paralyzed man on this bed, and they just lower him right into the middle of this room. They lower him right inside. And Jesus looks at this man and he looks at his friends and he saw that their faith was strong. See, his legs were weak, but his faith was strong. And Jesus looks at this group, and he says to them, he says to the man directly, he says, your sins are 
forgiven. He looks at this man and says, your sins are forgiven. What's that got to do with anything? The scribes, they were the chief rulers back in that day. They began to question in their mind. And they began to question in their hearts. And they say, who does this man think he is? He's this great teacher? Yes. He's, you know, proclaiming the gospel. He's teaching the word of God. Yes, that's true. But who does this man think he is that he's able to look at this guy and say that his sins are forgiven? And so Jesus, knowing their thoughts, knowing what they were thinking, he looks at them and he says, which is easier to say, that your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk? Well, the obvious answer is to say that your sins are forgiven. You don't have to prove that. There's no visual evidence that a person's sins are forgiven. He, he can make that statement, and you can just be like, okay, maybe you did it, maybe you didn't. But if he were to say to this man, rise up, take up your bed, and walk, then the rubber meets the road. Then he is actually on the hook for the claims that he is making. And so Jesus answers the question for them. And he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the ability to forgive sins, he looks at this man and he says, take up your bed and go home. And that man takes up his bed and he goes home. He's fully healed by Jesus. He's fully restored by the Savior. And these guys who, who saw this, everyone in the entire room, they were all shook. And they were amazed. And they began to praise and worship God for the impossible miracle that they had just witnessed. Some people even testified in Mark chapter 2, verse 12, we never saw anything like this. What kind of man is this? You see, Jesus is God. He could completely forgive sins. And he could heal a person from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. He truly was, as Thomas proclaimed, the Lord and God. Have you ever seen a movie where they broke the fourth wall? Where like an actress or an actor, they, they break that fourth wall. They turn and they address the audience in the movie. That's exactly what our Lord does here in this text. Right in the middle of acknowledging Thomas's statement, from the pages of Scripture all the way to right here with us in 2024, he looks at us and he says that we are blessed to believe without needing the sight that Thomas had. Thomas could see and believe, but all those who would come after Thomas would not see Jesus with their physical eyes, but they would also believe. That's you and that's me. We are blessed having never seen and yet believing, just as effectively as Thomas did, just as powerfully as Thomas did. As David told us a couple weeks ago and Lauren reminded us this morning, it isn't the strength of your faith that saves you, it's the object. Your faith doesn't have to be massive. It just has to be rooted in Christ. If the object is right, he provides the power. Just like the paralyzed man's friends and the paralyzed man himself believed, the person that they trusted in was powerful enough to heal their sin problem and their health problem. I love Peter's affirmation of this fact. Peter says this in his book. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, 
may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We trust and believe based on the word alone. You might say like Thomas did at first, I haven't seen him. I haven't touched him. Well, Jesus speaks to you too. He says to you, don't be unbelieving, but believe. We may not have visual evidence today, but we do have verbal evidence. We have eyewitness testimony. We have a firsthand account from someone who was truly there. Third, we see faith proclaimed. We see faith proclaimed in verses 30 through 31. He tells us the purpose of this gospel, the purpose of this book. You see, we genuinely have a firsthand account from someone who was the witness to all of the great miracles and words of Christ, the Apostle John. He has been our teacher and our guide throughout the entirety of this book that he has written. And just before the last chapter, he inserts this little explanation or better yet, this, this proclamation of his purpose in writing all of these things down. Everything that John wrote down had a singular purpose, that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, God's own son, and that by believing in these facts, you would have eternal life in his name. It's just that straightforward. He tells us that Jesus, for those three years, did more things than you could write down in all of the world's books in chapter 21. But John wrote down as many things as John could to inspire you to trust in Jesus as God's son. And we trust and believe because of the eyewitness testimony of apostles like Thomas and John, who were actually there. Ours... It's not a blind faith. It is a reasonable faith. We believe in historical facts, not fiction. We believe as the children of God have done from that day until this one. God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, who was a real man, who really was God in the flesh. He died on a real cross and rose from a real grave and was seen by real people. You should have absolute certainty in everything you believe about this person as far as your belief rests solely on the revelation of Christ in the Bible. That is exactly why we're going to sing Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. We sing that because we believe it. We can trust in his word. And I love what Spurgeon has reflected on when he looked at this passage. Spurgeon says, observe then, no part of Holy Scripture was written with any wish to magnify the writer of it. Many human books are evidently intended to let you see how profound are the thoughts of their authors or how striking is their style. If some authors can at any time introduce themselves, they do not hesitate to do so, even though they have to go out of their way to do it. But you shall never detect the least degree of this in any of the writers of sacred scripture. A most striking instance of this is found in John's Gospel, John was a man above all others fitted to write the life of Christ. Did he not know more of Jesus both by observation, by intimate fellowship, and by hearty sympathy with him than any of the other evangelists? And yet, he has left out many interesting facts which the others have recorded. Others, mark you, who did not actually see the facts as he did. And the most striking point is this. He omits 
as if of set purpose, those places of the history in which he would have shown. He and James and Peter were frequently selected by the master to be with him when others were excluded. But of these occasions, he says nothing. Three only were with our Lord in his transfiguration, and John was one of them. John does not mention that August event except it be that he says, We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, in which there may be a reference to it, but it is by no means clear. At any rate, he does not narrate the circumstance, but leaves it to other pens. This is a moral miracle. What uninspired man could have left out such a vision from his page? Even more striking is the fact that the master, when he took with them the 11 to the garden, left the major part of them at the gate, but he let the three further into the garden and bade them wait at about a stone's cast distance where some of them heard his prayers and observed his bloody sweat. John, who was one of them, says nothing about it. Had he forgotten it? That's impossible. Did he doubt it? Certainly not. But the omission shows you that these incidents were not written with the view of honoring John, but that the reader may be led to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He leaves out that which would have brought John into the front in order that he may fill up the whole foreground of his canvas with the portrait of his Lord. Everything is subordinated to the one grand end that ye should believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's his entire focus, Spurgeon tells us. Now I want to invite the band back up to the stage at this time. You see, God wants you not just to have faith, but he wants you to have life. I wish that we had time to go back and to look at this theme of, of life in the entire Gospel of John. We don't have time to do that here this morning, but John has been encouraging us to seek life in chapter after chapter of his inspired words. And we'll read just two quick examples. John 1, 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John also says in Chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He came to change the way we live, the manner of our earthly existence. He came to be our shaping force. He came to change our interests. He was sent to give us life, real life, abundant life, true life, unending life and light and love. As we close, where have you placed your faith? What is the object of your faith? Do you have life in his name? Are you ruled by doubt or by belief? Do you fully trust God? A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and raise to walk in newness of life.